Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. I think it's episode 94. So we are going to be, I'm going to be interviewing Derek Castle. I'm so excited to have him here, and I'm excited to have everybody else here also. Um, I'm doing it from home, so hopefully we're not going to have any issues today like I've been having at school. So here we go. So I'm glad to see lots of printmakers in the house. You guys go ahead and say hey in the chat to each other. Um, I know there's a bunch of you in there that are printmaker focused. But um, Derek Castle is uh, amazing. If you haven't ever seen his stuff, I can't wait to introduce you to him today. So Derek, give us a little bit of your background um, as design and then how you came into kind of printmaking. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, just at an early age, I was always, you know, interested in uh, design. So, I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, one of the first things that I would ever draw were, uh, were uh, anchor tattoos on my forearms because, you know, as a kid, I always watched Popeye, you know, so that sort of thing. So that, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, led me into just uh, you're really interested in um, my parents' record collection. So, I mean, I'm a child uh, of the 80s, and they, uh, my parents coming from like the, you know, the 60s and 70s, you know, had some really interesting music that they would listen to, like the band Yes, the Moody Blues, Fleetwood Mac, um, uh, you know, everything from uh, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, all that sort of stuff. So there was some really unique album covers that came along uh, with those records. So I remember as a kid, always drawing, you know, listening to the records and drawing those out. Um, and, and then from there, uh, just kind of going through school, um, being the, you know, the, you know, the kid that always drew in class rather than doing the homework. And, and then from there, it just, I really, I always knew that, you know, in some sort of way I was going to, um, be involved in design, but didn't really know what practical application. And then it was, you know, high school where there was actually a commercial art class and, um, and they actually, you know, dabbled a little bit in screen printing. So I remember, you know, being, uh, you know, being like, you know, 16 or whatever, uh, experimenting just ever so slightly with screen printing. I mean, it wasn't, you know, wasn't anything too uh, dramatic, but, uh, but, but I knew that, I, okay, I found my path. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that's what I want to do. And uh, I've actually got family that are graphic designers. So like my aunt is a graphic designer and what, as well, as well as my uncle. Uh, and they were a little bit apprehensive, you know, they discouraged me a little bit from, from going down that path because they, you know, they realized, the struggles that were involved, um, you know, a lot of time, and she, you know, her experience was working at an agency, and, uh, you know, and it just, you know, uh, in that atmosphere, you know, it may not be very uh, conducive to uh, graphic designers, especially, you know, just coming out of school, so, uh, but, but I really didn't know anything else. I mean, there was really nothing else that I could think uh, that I would do, so I, I proceeded to go to school for um, graphic design, and you know it was it was just a local uh little college here in nashville i mean not anything uh you know too noteworthy uh but you know i you know so i went through that experience and felt like it did not really prepare me for the real world you know coming out um so i you know i came out of school um you know uh, i was working at, at the time at fedex you know just being a package handler and whatnot um and and so you know so so you know fresh eyed out of school, you know, trying to find a job and, and really, you know, was not able to find one. You know, I remember one of my interviews uh, that I had was at a local service bureau, spent all day there, um, you know, just kind of, you know, they were talking to me about what they do, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, when it came down to the end of the day, they were like, yeah, we're really excited to have you on board. You know, we want to bring you on. And we kind of got to the conversation of uh, compensation, and they literally wanted to pay me like seven dollars and fifty cents an hour, you know, and that was just <laughs> so discouraging. And I was like, oh wow, you know, my aunt and uncle, they were right, you know, this was the wrong career path. <laughs> so uh, at that point, I, I, you know, I just had to sort of reevaluate things and uh, figure out, you know, what what is it, you know, what can I do, you know, what's and, and at the time, you know, this is going to, you know, show my age a little bit, uh, but this was around 
like 99, uh, 99, where um, I actually took an internship at a uh, design or a, uh, a web shop. So it was basically, you know, this was kind of early on in the, the days of the internet, but I mean, it was when it was really becoming prominent. So I um, took a internship at this, uh, it was like a healthcare uh, website shop, and it just sort of, you know, we're, we're doing like those old, like uh, animation banners, the animated GIFs sort of stuff. Uh, you know, just contributing a little bit, you know, as far as like uh, design, you know, designing out content. And then, you know, from that, from there, I started learning HTML. And at the time, you know, it wasn't like, you know, CSS and, you know, div structures and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it was like old, like table structures. And, you know, we, you know, I wasn't really working within any, uh, you know, type of content management system. It was all just like static pages. And sort of, I, you know, I, so from there, I, I started to get excited in design again and, and thought, wow, I could, you know, I could actually do this. So they, you know, they offered me a full-time job and there, there, there I went. So I, you know, actually, you know, it was, you know, leaps and bounds better than my first offer. And at that point, you know, I went home and, you know, told my girlfriend, you know, oh, they offered me a full-time job and, uh, you know, yeah, I'm making this, and she was like, "All right, great. When are we getting married?" So, so th from there, <laughs> so from there, you know, and we had been talking about it when we had been going out for a long time, and uh, and I just told her, I was like, "I'm not making enough money. I, you know, I don't want you to have to live the way that I'm living, you know, and all this sort of stuff." So, so you know, things sort of took off, and uh, you know, fast forward uh, through time a little bit. Um, you know, I, I continue to sort of develop, you know, in the web, but then realized, well, you know, there's actually like a whole part of this design experience that I feel like I'm missing. You know, I'm missing really some of the some of the essential components to, you know, why I, I got involved in it uh, to start with. So that's, you know, and it was really the illustration side of it. So I started, um, you know, just... So I started with the idea that I wanted to uh, create a t-shirt line and I, you know, discovered that after I had been involved in some online communities like uh, Threadless and uh, uh, Designed by Humans and then at the time there was this website called MTs and it was basically like a whole community of, uh, of, of t-shirt designers and, and, the, and I, I noticed that like all the designs were very, very illustration heavy so uh, so that's what I decided I wanted to do, uh, you know, at least on the side, you know, just kind of dabble in that. And um, I, you know, so I started, I started posting things, started getting a little bit of interest. And, and then, um, you know, through some of those websites, ended up getting picked up by Live Nation as a freelance artist. And Live Nation is basically like a merch company for like a lot of the, uh, you know, like the top musical acts so you know so at that time uh i got to do you know a lot of t-shirt stuff for you know for bands that i actually grew up with listening to like uh you know ozzy osbourne um van halen and even some of my parents bands like rod stewart and i i like rod stewart uh and then like uh leonard skinnerd um uh, Steve Miller band and then you know some more modern day artists like Kid Rock at least you know modern at that time uh, but yeah so I mean that's essentially how I got into design the path that it that I went through and then I just sort of realized you know if I wanted to ever do this on my own you know that whole feeling as it is and how cool the projects are uh, and how it's really uh, elevated, I guess, sort of my, you know, my social media component of, of just having things out there and visible, you know, the, the pay just isn't sustainable for, uh, you know, for someone like myself that's got, you know, that's married and has two kids. So I had to sort of reevaluate that, figure out the type of work that I could do that would be sustainable. Uh, so I, you know, started kind of moving into a different direction. Um, you know, doing more, uh, you know, freelance outside of, you know, that merch, uh, merch business. And then that's sort of where I, I got into block printing was, you know, I really wanted a, uh, a way to create art 
you know, on my own uh, and not have to involve, like, and I tried my hand at screen printing, screen printing, and it just, it did not go well. I mean, there was a lot of technical aspects to it that I just couldn't really grasp. Uh, so, and plus I didn't have the room for it. I mean, you know, there's a lot of equipment that's involved with it. I tried to build my own exposure rig and, you know, it was just always off, you know, either my screen was underexposed or it was, you know, overexposed. And I, I mean, I had it, the exposure was set at the exact same time. So just a lot of different components that, you know, that were tripping me up. And I just realized with block printing, um, you know, here's something that, that is, you know, for me, I mean, it's time consuming and, uh, you know, it, it does take time, but I did not le need a lot of equipment. Really all I needed were, were my hands and patience to be able to pull that off. And plus it just had a really cool sort of, uh, you know, old school primitive aesthetic that I really liked to it. Um, so, you know, and, and, and I wanted to do that because I wanted to be able to print artwork on my own. With, and not have have to rely on someone else to you know print it for me. So like you know the t-shirt stuff, you know it. I was doing the block prints. There's really very little overhead where you know do, yeah printing uh, silkscreen posters or t-shirts. There's quite a bit of overhead. So I mean you know half of the you know half of the 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 price that I'm charging for a t-shirt you know actually you know goes into uh, you know, the price that I, I paid for the blank t-shirts and the, you know, the screen costs and the ink costs and all that. So, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, block printing was really cool because I could do it all on my own without, you know, any, uh, assistance from anybody else. So that, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, you know, a little bit of where I came from. So I think there was a, uh, image that you sent me um, and I'm going to pull it up and if you're new to Spreecast I'm the only one that can get rid of this image so this is I think this is maybe did um, and I don't this was this something obviously you did it in 03 when did Straw Castle start and when did you really was it in 99 or was it uh, after that uh, well I, I can say it's you know Straw Castle kind of started uh, not as Straw Castle. I actually, my first sort of online handle was called Nashville Mafia. And, uh, and, and, and what it was, was, you know, again, you know, just trying to create, you know, my own brand. And uh, there's, and I, you know, sort of when I started, you know, I was kind of always doing, um, I'm sorry, I've got to close out some little pop-ups that just came up. Um, <clears throat> I, I got started doing, uh, you know, doing the web stuff and was really inspired by it, by it, but it was, but it was healthcare oriented, which is, you know, there's a pretty clear cut template for that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's fairly corporate and whatnot. So, so at that, you know, so around 99, I, uh, you know, I was really involved with a musical artist here in Nashville, um, Hank Williams, the third, who is the grandson of Hank Williams, uh, senior son of Hank Jr. And I, um, I, and I, used, I was, I developed his website and then handled, you know, a little bit of his merch. And there was another artist out of Kentucky, uh, Keith Neltner, that did a lot of his merch as well. Uh, but that's sort of where I, I began, you know, kind of creating my own brand was doing some work with him and then sort of establishing an aesthetic. So that, so early on, that did sort of get me into the band merch. So, uh, you know, this image here um, is actually, it was done after I sort of, I, I kind of got out of band merch a little bit, but I was, uh, I was, uh, I was contacted by the, you know, I guess the, the founder of uh, Streetlight Manifesto and, you know, and he had seen my block prints and was like, and really liked that aesthetic. So, I mean, he reached out to me to do it without going through his management or anything. And, and I, I thought that was really cool. So, you know, I felt like, oh, that's an opportunity I can't pass up. And, and the sort of design that he wanted, I felt like was right in my wheelhouse. Uh, you know, sort of this old, like almost collegiate sort of seal with like this fighting panther sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a little bit about that design and and just the early inception of Straw Castle. I guess I could say maybe 2005 was when I switched over to the name Straw Castle because I felt like 
maybe the name Nashville Mafia had a little bit too much of a negative connotation to it. And I felt like, you know, if I, if I do, you know, break into some legitimate freelance work, you know, I don't want to be held down by a name that, you know, that's not, that doesn't seem professional. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, I'm going to pull up some of the other band stuff that, and here's the Rod, yeah. one of the Rod Stewart ones. I don't know if you want to talk about any of these real quick and then we'll. Yeah, no. So this Rod Stewart, yeah, this Rod Stewart design was, was just so hilarious. Uh, it, yeah, they, they, had, the band had, well, the, you know, Live Nation had contacted me and basically said that, you know, Rod wanted, you know, and back in the days of, gosh, I cannot think of his old faces, I think was, I think was his old band, if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong about that. Uh, but, you know, he was, they, they, you know, he was known as the rooster because of his, you know, his crazy, uh, spiky, sticky up hair. Uh, so he wanted a, a design of a, of a rooster with, uh, with the Rod Stewart hair drinking a beer. So I was like, well, that's, you know, that's, you know, it's not necessarily ambitious, but that's a crazy, uh, that's a crazy creative brief, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it and, you know, kind of sketched out the idea and, you know, they showed it to, to Rod and his management and they were, they were like, oh, we love it. You know, just, you know, go forth and, and conquer. So, so yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of the backstory there. So one of my favorite bands is Steve Miller. So I have to pull that one up. Yeah. Yeah. So Steve Miller is actually I remember as a kid. Uh, I don't know if you remember the song Abracadabra. Mm -hmm. It's like it's uh, it's like the the early '80s. So um, for all right, my my mother's name was Deborah, and for some reason when I heard. Like my uh, from a nostalgic standpoint, whenever I think of Steve Miller, I think of that song Abracadabra. But I didn't know the lyrics. I thought they were saying Deborah to Deborah. You know, my like that was my only frame of reference was my mom's name. You know, so uh, so when they yeah when so when they uh, uh, approached me to do Steve Miller, I was like, oh yeah, that'd be that'd be great. You know, my mom would really get a kick out of this. So. Uh, and, and Steve Miller band was like definitely one of the records that I listened to. And I remember drawing the Joker, you know, when I was a kid. Um, so when they came to me, they wanted, you know, so Steve Miller had like the classic Pegasus sort of design um, that he did, you know, the old T-shirt. And it might have even been an album cover. Um, but they just wanted sort of like an, uh, a modern, uh, a modern refresh of that. And, uh, and, and that's essentially what this is, you know, just kind of sketched out the idea, you know, uh, you know, redid the, the type a little bit and they, you know, they, uh, Live Nation was super happy with it. And I, I even got confirmation, um, you know, that on the tour that this was one of the best sellers that, you know, that they had on the tour, uh, and even, uh, you know, from previous tours, I mean, it did really well and, and uh, I was talking to one of the guys from Live Nation just the other day because, I mean, we still stay in contact and everything. And he was saying, yeah, I mean, Steve even pulls it out even today. I mean, this design was probably done, you know, five or six years ago. You know, but he still pulls it out and brings it out on tour because he just he really liked it. So it was a that, super cool design to work on. That's cool. So most of these have a lot of different colors. And were you working by hand? Were you in that same kind of block print mode yet, or did that come later? Yeah, so this was prior to the block printing stuff. So, so this was all pen and ink, um, and this was even before you know, like a lot of the the, the client base sort of stuff I do these days are um, on a Cintiq. So, like all this stuff was prior to me even working digitally. So it was all pen and ink. And then I would actually, I would actually scan uh, the vellum in, and uh, so I, you know, I'd pen, I, I would, I would draw it out on paper, you know, in pencil, and then I would lay the pencil work underneath vellum, and then I would trace back over the pencil uh, with pen and ink, and then I would take, and the 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 pieces of paper would be like ten by thirteen, and I didn't have a a scanner big enough to actually scan that, so I had to actually scan it in segments and then patch it all back together. And and like when I think about that today, I'm like, oh my god, you know, I, it, it was really super cool to have you know finished pen and ink pieces uh, when I you know 
left when I was done, but at the same time, it was not efficient at all. I mean, it just took so long to do each piece. And, you know, there are uh, guys like Brandon Reich out there that, you know, that are cranking out. I mean, it's, it's insane, like 10 to 15 uh, merch designs a day. That's what he said. I mean, that is absolutely crazy where these one pieces, they would come to me and say, all right, we've got, a, we've got an idea for you. We want, you know, want you to do this. You know, how long, you know, will this take you? I'm like, eh, you know probably like two weeks and they're like, okay, you know, so, I mean, they like the work. So they're like, all right, well, we're going to get one solid design out of Derek, but Brandon's over here cranking out 15 of them. But, you know, I still, you know, it's just, the, that's just what it was. So, so yeah, it was pen and ink. And then I actually, I did color it. In, so I, when I scanned it all in, I colored it uh, digitally. So, yeah. So most of them were getting colored digitally? Yeah, all of them, yeah. I colored all of them digitally, and then the line work. So, I mean, it's sort of like comic style, you know, where it's like all, you know, mm -hmm. key line and then colored uh, digitally, yeah. Right. So, so, and then, yeah, so this is another example. You know, this was a super cool project, the Woodstock project. It was, uh, you know, just something that, you know, I grew up with. I mean, my parents were total hippies, and you know, I remember watching Woodstock the movie when I was a kid, you know, and yes, I was a kid and there was nudity, but I guess in my house, you know, it just wasn't a big deal. Uh, but I mean, they were hippies. So, so yeah, I mean, th this was so fun to kind of harken back to that, you know, to that, to that era, because I, you know, personally, I love the music, you know, Santana, Jimi Hendrix, uh, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. Well, um, for me, all of these, it's just amazing that you, did them by hand and then you piece them together scanning. So at what point in <laughs> did you get um, a bigger scanner? And then at what point did you start, did you start using the Cintiq? Well, so yeah, basically I never got a bigger scanner. I always pieced them together. And that was sort of the thing was like, I was realizing, uh, yeah, you know, I, for a while there, I had a chalkboard behind me, you know, behind my desk with all the projects. And then, like, keep in mind, this is all in addition to my full-time job, you know. So I had, like, all these uh, freelance projects that I was working on. I was just thinking, man, you know, I'm getting plenty of work now. So, I, you know, you know, how do I make, you know, I did, but I just didn't have the time to actually do it. You know, how do I make things more efficient? So, so at that point, I, I, I finally came to the realization. And... This may have been in uh, 2009, 2010, maybe, where I, I, I felt like, all right, I finally, and I'm bad with dates. It could have been, you know, two years ago. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I finally came to terms with the fact that I'm, this actually might help put it into perspective when this was. I, I came to terms with a need to actually invest in a Cintiq. At, so at the time, I finally made that decision they were uh, they were not being produced anymore. I couldn't find them anywhere because of a tsunami that hit Japan, and it completely wiped out their manufacturing plant. So there, I, I mean, it was like six months. You know, so I looked around for six months trying to find a Cintiq because I finally decided I've got the money saved up. I want to actually get this thing. Um, and it, you know, and six months in, I finally found like this, uh, this little mom and pop website that had a refurbished Cintiq that uh, Wacom uh, was using uh, as like a demonstration model at like conventions and stuff. And he assured me, man, this thing is like tip top. It's in very good shape, even got like a thousand dollar discount on it. Uh, so I was like, oh, yeah, ship it to me. So and I'm still using it today. Um, but yeah, that's when things really started changing, started getting a whole lot more efficient, was able to take on uh, more work because the other processes were, you know, far more streamlined. But you're still working by hand. You do, um, you know, you're, you have a lot of hand in each, pro each part of the process. It seems like from what I get from um, your Instagram. Yeah. Page, yeah. People, so yeah. like you're, you're drawing I mean, it by hand and then scanning in and redrawing it? Yeah, essentially so. I, I mean, a lot of people, uh, they actually do their sketching on Cintiq. But for me, you know, just kind of the pencil and paper 
is, you know, it, it's just more fluid for me and I'm able to express my ideas, I guess, a little bit better with pencil and paper, just the tactile nature of it. So, so like, yeah, when I'm, um, when I'm working on a project, like I, I will, I will almost get an illustration, um, completely sketched out to, I mean, and you can get a really good idea of what the finished piece is going to look like from that sketch. Cause I mean, it's a fairly detailed sketch. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's all done, you know, with pencil and paper. And then from that point, I scan in that paper and then the, the, it really, the Cintiq is basically the inking and the coloring process. And, you know, with the block print sort of stuff, that is all done by hand. So, I mean, that's all, you know, kind of going back to those old inking techniques, uh, you know, using my Faber Castle brush pens to actually ink on the blocks. So, so I, you know, I feel like I'm fulfilled in that, you know, where I'm doing, and, I, and that may have been, you know, sort of like a subconscious reason why I did kind of go back to block printing was because I felt like I was losing so much, uh, you know, working ex almost exclusively digital. So, um, so, so yeah. So when you're, so just to think about, to me, it's kind of amazing that you're, working as a web designer by day in kind of a healthcare industry and then you have this other life where you're doing yeah. very different <laughs> much more tactile as well as just much more illustrative than probably what you're doing in your day job and yes so Hannah so and now my cat's here um that's the problem with having, so my dog hopefully won't start barking at some point. But so um, they've been talking about the helmet. So I'm going to pull that up real quick. And this, it looks like you did it by yeah. hand, completely by hand. And you'll have to um, give us kind of a. a yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that was completely done by hand. Uh, and yeah, so that was just something, um, you know, so after I had gotten done doing that the the Miller Har Harley Davidson project, you know, I just kind of had this. I mean, I was just you know had this whole badass you know motorcycle sort of thing going on, you know, where I wanted to you know tap into that a little bit. And there's like there's actually a a local uh, coffee shop here in Nashville called Barista Parlor that's it's basically in an old like garage, and and they just they've got the and it and it just exudes this sort of vibe and. Uh, I recently went to a show there uh, where, uh, you know, a band was playing up on stage and and as the band is playing, you know, they're like drowned out by motorcycles that are like cruising past the stage, you know. So 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 those two experiences just sort of like, oh, you know, I, it would be really cool to actually illustrate, you know, one of these, uh, you know, one of these kind of vintage motorcycle helmets. And because I'm just imagining some, you know, some real, you know, rough looking biker, you know, just kind of, you know, cruising uh, across the barista parlor, you know, on their, you know, on their motorcycle, you know, wearing a really cool helmet. So, <clears throat> so I ordered this, this, uh, this helmet and I really didn't know how I was going to execute the design, but, but I just kind of sketched out some, some ideas on, uh, you know, on paper and then, uh, you know, and then took, and like the, the, the actual, uh, coating of this helmet. It's not as glossy as some of the helmets that I've uh, seen in the past. It actually has somewhat of a matte finish, which was a, a, a really good, you know, pleasant surprise because it was super easy to work with. So I was actually even able to, to draw on the helmet with pencil uh, to get my, you know, sort of my basic shapes down. And uh, as you'll see there, Sharpies, I mean, it was just basically pencils and Sharpies. Um, and I yeah, I posted that last night. I just, you know, this is the only the the first side of this design. Um, I haven't finished it yet, but I mean, I just finished this last night, or at least this illustration. So, yeah, so the, it was all done by hand. So then, have you figured out what the other side's going to be, or have you not even done that part yet? No, I don't even know yet. <laughs> so, so, like, my initial I. My initial idea was it's going to be the same illustration on both sides, which, you know, thinking of thinking about that, I think, well, that that's kind of boring. You know, why would I do that? And then 
after I finished it, I was like, yeah, there's no way I'm doing it again because it would, it would be boring for me to draw the same design over again. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the second side is going to be. And I've also, there's a stripe that, uh, actually I've got the helmet right here. So, um, so, so basically, you know, here's, uh, let me, yeah, here we go. So here's the, you know, the illustration and then you kind of turn it around. Now I'm going to have a stripe that goes, uh, down through here and I've got to come up with an idea for that and then, uh, come up with an idea for, you know, this side and then, you know, some sort of idea for the, you know, sort of the bottom here. But yeah, so I'm, it's a work in progress and, I've actually already had emails for people interested in it, and and at this point, I think I'm going to hang on to it just because, like, I don't know. At this point, I don't know how to put a price on it because right. it's so new, and I, yeah, I just feel like it's kind of a cool thing. So yeah, I don't know. So, what? How long does something like that normally take? Like, will it take months to totally finish it, or will it be something that you kind of work on the side, or will you just like, hey, this weekend you're going to figure out the stripe, and then you're going to figure out the other side, and and within two weeks, you'll have it finished. Uh, well, at this point, since it's a, it's a new thing that I've never done, I'm not sure how long it will take me to finish it. But I know uh, I ordered the the helmet uh, last week, and I got it in. Um, today's Wednesday. I got it in on Monday, uh, and my wife was going to the store uh, last night, and I was like, "Hey, pick up some sharpies." Uh, and I mean, I had I had it finished at least that portion of it, uh, you know, probably in about two hours. But you know, I had the I had the idea of what I wanted to do already sketched out in pencil on paper. So so it wasn't like it was completely concept to to finish. But but at this point, you know, who knows? Like I've got a big project that I'm working on, uh, and this this was something I was just able to do sort of like, you know, in my you know, a little bit of a downtime between feedback loops on a project that I'm working on. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, it, I don't know when I'll actually be able to get back to it. So, right. you know, time, time will tell. <laughs> so we'll take us through your process. <laughs> we haven't even really gotten to question two, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> um, this is what happened. Yeah, that, means the, that, that means the conversation is actually, it's a fluid conversation. It's where I, I, I like that. It's good. It's good. No, it's great. Um, and we've get, gotten some things. So it's st some people have already asked some questions, but I wanted people to realize that really you're doing this. Um, this is kind of an outlet for you. This be it became the block printing and this side drawing isn't necessarily what you do because I think a lot of people think that that's what you do every day. And I think a lot of designers yeah. have this side life um, that they're still doing design, but it's more in the fashion of what their what where their heart is or where and. I think it's it's nice to know that maybe you you don't and that's one of my later questions and you can go ahead and answer it yeah. and we've kind of already answered it but you know if you um do you have any plans of going full time with straw castle or do you always see it kind of as something that's on the side because you sell stuff yeah. um, at art shows you do um, you have online stores as well and then you also do client work so. Do you have any plans if you had to go full time? Would you? Yeah, uh, if I had to, I wouldn't have a choice. Uh, <laughs> I guess, but no. Uh, but yeah, no. I, I mean, I think, I you know, with what I'm doing um, with my day job, it makes it so hard because I actually really like the people that I work with. I like, um, I like what I'm doing. I think it's important, uh, you know, at least for me. Um, uh, to be well, well, to be versatile, versatile, uh, well versed in you know different areas of design. So, like, I realized my struggles, you know, sort of early on, you know, in design, kind of coming out of school, being a print designer, and not being able to find a job. That it's really important for me to 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 hang on to the you know, and keep up to date, you know, with web trends and. They're, they are always, um, they're always changing and, uh, you know, new things are emerging all the time. So, you know, like where I'm at, you know, like I was saying, like it would make it really easy if I got up to go to work every day and I hated it, you know, but I don't, I mean, I really like the people 
I've, I've literally been where, where I am and have been working with some of the same people for 15 years. So they're, they're, you know, they're really, I don't even consider them coworkers anymore. They're almost family. So it'd be like, you know, me leaving family. So I guess the, 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 the answer to that is time, who knows, you know, time will tell, but at this point, and two, you know, from a freelance perspective, I'm starting to get some bigger clients. Um, uh, Wait, you know, Miller, things he are a big client. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and like, I've got a project that I'm working on now that I, you know, I can't mention yet, but I'm super excited about it. And it could be another one of those, you know, game changers. But, um, but, you know, for the longest time I've had, you know, no lack of work. It's just a lack of, of, you know, of having a sustainable income from it, you know, because it's just so, you know, you know, being, uh, being self-employed is, uh, is tricky in the sense of, of you just don't know where your next paycheck's coming from. And there's, you know, having that full-time job is, it takes so much pressure off of, uh, you know, of what I'm, you know, what I'm doing on the side where I've actually, I've had projects before where, you know, if I didn't have a, a, uh, a full-time job, I would have been just, you know, I would have been, you know, in, in you know, just a ball of nerves about this, but I had a project where somebody had paid me a pretty substantial deposit, uh, for a project and the, and, and he was just like the project itself was just not going anywhere. It was stalling and it was, uh, it was just becoming very toxic and it was causing a lot of stress, a lot of headache. And I got to the point where, like, I don't need this, and I, and I gave him the deposit back to get out of it, you know. And uh, and and if I was, you know, doing this full time, I, I probably couldn't have done that, you know. But I actually lost money to get out of a toxic relationship with the client. Um, so having that freedom is 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 really uh, a really good for me. Um, and two, you know, I just kind of, uh, you know, I wonder, you know, what it would be like if, um, if, if I did do this full time, would it sort of take the fun out of it? You know, would I be taking on jobs that I ordinarily wouldn't? Uh, because now, you know, I've, I've become very selective actually in what I work on. Uh, and this, you know, doesn't directly relate to the question, but it's kind of like the idea of, uh, you know, there was a point in time where I was really filled up with lots of small, um, small projects um, that just, they, they weren't, uh, you know, they were cool in their own right, but it was just kind of like one of those things early on where I felt like, you know, I, you know, if a project comes, I can't turn it down. I've just got to take on everything that right. comes uh, because if I turn it down, they won't come back. So I had a, just my lap was just full of all these small projects that I was working on. And I was stressed about it because, you know, it's a lot of work there, you know, it's a lot of work at the day job. And then at that time, you know, it's just almost kind of like when it, you know, when it rains, it floods or whatever the expression is, um, when it rains, it pours, I think. Uh, but the, so, so I had this, one of these big clients uh, send me uh, an email wanting me to work on this big, big project. And I couldn't do it. I had to turn them down because... That, I mean, it was going to be one of those projects that would have been a game changer, but, but I had made, you know, so many other commitments and I didn't want to be the guy that just emails them, oh, got something better, see it, you know, so, so I, so I had to turn it down and I, and I expressed to them, I was like, you know, the, you know, I, man, with so much reluctance, I can't do this just because I'm spread so thin, but I, uh, please come back, please come back to me, you know, I'll be clear a month if there's any other projects that you have coming your way. Uh, luckily I did hear back from them, uh, but, but that was kind of an eye opener where I decided, and that was, that's when I decided I'm, you know, I'm being very selective in what I do. I'm going to focus on myself instead and that really about that time is when I started building, you know, my own sort of brand with the block prints, doing more shows and stuff like that, because I had more time because I was turning down, you know, probably 75% of the work that came to me and focused on that. And then, you know, so, sort of the, the funny thing about that was 
when I started focusing on the work that I really enjoyed, which is the block printing, the stuff that was for myself, that's when the really cool projects started coming in where it was things that I really wanted to do. So, you know, it wasn't until I focused on myself that people really started to take more notice and, and you know, started landing some bigger clients that, you know, that felt like maybe, you know, I had, you know, a little bit more of a unique aesthetic. So, yeah, I guess that's uh, a roundabout way of answering it. <laughs> I, no, I think that's great. And I think that, I think that a lot of um, designers who are starting or people who are kind of in that job who they don't really they're not really doing exactly what they want to do I think it's great advice that and that's kind of where I am too I kind of have taken a little bit of yeah. step back so that I can work on a project and you do you have to you have to take um, it's a, a sacrifice because you're giving up some money so that you can do something else that maybe possibly will help other people or get you the kind of work that you want to do so there are yeah, a couple other exactly couple couple questions so Nikki is a printmaker uh -huh. and she has she says did you take any relief classes in school or how were you introduced to that type of printmaking like linoleum cutting or block printing or whatever yeah honestly um, I was not yeah so I you know I hear so many people you know like when I did my uh, my workshop at uh, Creative South and just you know at the a lot of the shows you know where I've got my my blocks setting out, you know, so many people are like, oh, I totally remember doing this in school. I, I actually didn't, you know. So, so I, I, I sort of was turned on to it through a roundabout way, you know, um, like old Chinese block prints. So, like, I was always familiar with it. I was familiar with the way that, you know, that, uh, you know, like the sort of Asian culture had embraced um, uh, block printing. I mean, I, I mean, it was probably 2,000 years ago or whatever. Um, so, so I, 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 I knew about that and that's sort of what, what got me interested in it. Uh, and then early on my, my initial idea, you know, sort of back to the t-shirt thing, you know, where lots of people out there, you know, like, you know, especially like letterpress printers, you know, they're, they think in terms of, uh, stationary and, uh, you know, gig posters and that, like, I've always thought of things through the, the filter of t-shirts, you know. So I initially wanted to use block printing uh, as a way to um, to print T-shirts, and then I, you know, I, I I have yet to do that. At some point, I hope to give that a try. But just sort of what I discovered, you know, as I was experimenting with printing, uh, you know, block printing was just the 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 nature of it is a little, especially the way I do it, where I don't have a press. You know, it's all elbow grease. Uh, you know, the the results vary quite a bit. So with paper stock, you know, if I, you know, fudge, you know, so if I'm printing, you know, and really I'm only able to print about 30, 30, 40 at the most at a time before, you know, I'm just fatigued and can't do it just because it's all, you know, done by hand. And, I, you know, say out of those, uh, you know, those you know, 40, I've got, you know, seven of them that just, you know, the, the ink just didn't lay right. You know, it just, right. it just didn't work well. You know, I could, I could easily toss that out, but with a t-shirt, you know, ruining, a, ruining a blank t-shirt, you're just out a little bit more money. So I just haven't yet experimented with it. Uh, but so, you know, I had, uh, I had remembered seeing like the old, um, you know, like <laughs> PBS videos of, uh, of like the, the the people in India making like all the you know the fabric the textile stuff using block printing so I had been exposed to it just through um, you know just like different cultures and stuff but never actually had any hands on experience until I you know just I got it and started you know experimenting and trying it and and uh, and Diane you saw some of my early ones. Uh, some of the first ones that I did at the um, at Creative South, and they were not very good. So, so I mean, it's you know, I, it you know, it takes a while to uh, to to master that, or or at least become comfortable enough with it to to pull off some some decent designs. It does, and registering. I know most of the ones I've seen from you that are block printing. I mean, you change colors, but, and you have some that you're doing yeah. over printing. You'll do like one design and then you'll put something else on top. Um, but it's hard to register that stuff. And then you have to have blocks the exact same. Is that something that you're interested in getting into? Or is that kind of 
like, nah, that's, you know, I kind of like the one well, color. Well, actually, Go ahead. yeah, so I did, so, so my first two block prints were single colors. Then actually the, the next one that I did where I was like, okay, I feel, I feel like I've got the hang of it. It was a two color. So I've done, I think I've done in total, maybe five, two color prints, but I don't actually have them available anymore just because there's some, you know, yeah, like you said, the registering is a little tricky. So not only is it registering when you are printing, it's registering the design when you're actually drawing it and carving it. So, I mean, yeah. you have to register it twice. So, uh, so it's a little challenging. Um, and not so much that it's uh, discouraging, but but I just noticed that you know when I when I you know sort of put those block prints up online, you know with all the extra effort that went into um, the two colored ones, like they just really didn't get any more feedback, or it wasn't like they were you know received any better than the single color ones. So I just decided, well, you know instead of spending double the amount of time on one design I'm just going to do two separate designs you know yeah. so I just you know it's just a matter of you know just producing you know just new work you know right well it, and also seems like you are great at getting that amazing image with just one color and you have it, they're really dramatic and not a lot, not everybody has that gift they some people need those extra colors to get the impact so well, yeah, you're right. Because I mean, you know, early early on, you know, sort of like when I was doing the uh, the merch designs, I felt like I relied a lot on extra color. I relied a lot on you know extra lines, you know, just to kind of hide bad right. compositional, you know, right. sort of things. Where I realized those things are glaring, you know, if you've got a bad composition or a bad concept with block printing. So it's sort of you know, forced me to uh, to take a step back and think of things uh, in its more primitive form, and just really uh, spend a lot of time thinking about the composition. And I've actually, you know, I haven't shown the, you know, some of these processes, but like on some of the the designs, like I'll actually ink it out on paper before I ink it out on the block, just to make sure that that composition is solid. You know, so I mean, it, so something like I, even though I, I have, I've started to become more efficient at carving where I'm faster at doing that, I feel like now I'm spending a lot more time on the concept and making sure that, you know, because in the beginning, I would work on a block, I would draw it out, or I would draw it out in pencil and then carve it, and then I'd have no idea what it was going to look like until I printed it. And then I'd print it, and it'd be like, "Oh my God, I'm never showing this to anybody." So I just toss it, and and nobody ever sees those. But now, you know, I want to know if I'm spending all that effort carving it. I want to know that it's solid, so I'll spend the extra time up front, you know, inking it out on a piece of paper to make sure that I, at least I feel comfortable with the concept. So, so right. yeah, I mean, it's been a real exercise in composition and just having you know, a strong, uh, strong sense of, of design, you know, with very, you know, minimal line work, because it's really, you, know, you really can't hide, hide those, uh, you know, those faults in block printing. So, um, I want to go back, but it seems like such a difference, your work color wise from where you, the t-shirts that you started with that we looked at in the beginning to where you are now. Yeah. And it, it just it goes to show I mean people are always developing and growing and you know what we think with all the colors sometimes I mean they all were great and beautiful but wow if you can control that with minimal color and still get a yeah. similar effect it, that's powerful well and, and like I you know a lot of the stuff that I had done previously you know with the band merch and even you know uh, and I, I had talked, I've talked a little bit about this, like at the, uh, at Creative South, but, uh, where I started, you know, in the, the in the t-shirt world, what, what, you know, what my original sort of aesthetic was, was, was much, was much more, um, you know, illustrative, very, you know, you know, using like, a, you know, I would try, I would, I would, I have to, you know, stop myself from adding colors. I mean, I'd have like, you know, eight different colors and then have to reduce down and figure out how to do it in halftones. 
and I felt like, you know, partly it was because I, you know, was a little bit inexperienced, but it was also partly what I was exposed to. So, you know, kind of going back to, you know, one of the earlier communities that I was involved, well, just really all of them. So, you know, like all these online t-shirt communities, like, you know, what MTs was, what, you know, designed by humans and threadless and just, you know, and when I started doing all this, this was the age of t-shirt contests. Right. You know, I mean, you had type or you had a shirt fight. I mean, you just had like, there was 20 of them. And, uh, you know, more than that, I mean, they were just all over the place. And I, you know, I participated in them all. Uh, but, but I was just seeing what other people were doing and seeing what I thought was popular and trying to put my own spin on it. But it what, but they weren't even things that I would wear. It was just things that was popular. It was getting a lot of notice. And, uh, and, and so that's sort of like where my old aesthetic was with a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. And, and then, uh, and, you know, cause I'm old, cause really I'm more drawn to the more simplistic. I mean, I just love black and white. I mean, if I could just do black and white, I would be super happy with that from every project here on out because because it is, it's actually more challenging. I feel like than color, and two, I just, I, I, I would rather spend that time up front, uh, you know, working on the composition rather than, you know, kind of on the back end incorporating the colors and that sort of stuff. And you know, that's where I'm at today. Who knows what happens to uh, tomorrow? <laughs> so I want to get back. Hannah had a question. How much time per day yeah. would you say you spend on side projects? It seems like with a full time job and a family, you would be up all night. Yeah, uh, it's a, it is a balancing act, um, and yeah, I, I probably should spend more time, uh, you know, just kind of embracing, you know, the the whole family thing. But like I, you know, I'll in a roundabout way, I'll answer that question. Where you know, I've had a lot of people, you know, like I would love to have a studio. Uh, you know, my own really super cool studio where I do work, but I realized if I had that studio, I would, ab I would absolutely never be home. So, you know, so like when I'm, you know, when I'm at home and I'm working, I mean, it's like an in and out door sort of thing. I mean, the kids are, you know, coming in, they're collaborating with me. They're, you know, kind of showing me what sucks and what doesn't, you know, I mean, they're pointing out, you know, that doesn't look right. And so I spend you know, on average, like, I mean, it's ridiculous. Maybe six hours a day on freelance, and there may be nights off, um, or freelance and my own personal stuff. Uh, but I'll, you know, I'll kind of come home, you know, eat dinner, hang out, you know, take the dog out. Um, and, and I, you know, but I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a workaholic. What do I say? <laughs> so too much time. <laughs> me me too so i i'm i'm with you yeah. but 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 it's also something that you love so it doesn't feel so much like work and um i'm with well, you i think that's the thing i, I think that's the thing is it's because that's what i would be doing anyway i mean that's what i really enjoy doing and 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 it's it's like you know my wife is super awesome because she's so supportive on everything that i that i want to do because you know it you know, let's just say, for example, I had a bad day at the office, you know, if I come home and, you know, I'm sort of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> you know, I'm expressing some uh, frustration with, uh, with my wife. She's just, she's like, just quit. You don't need that. You know, I mean, she's just super supportive. I mean, she's told me many, many times, you know, if you want to do this, if you really want to do this, you know, this, you know, freelance thing, just quit your job, you know? And I'm just like, no, but I'm the, I'm the dad, you know, I've got a, I can't quit, you know, I've got so many people counting on me and, you know, so, you know, and, and I, you know, even though there are nights where I'll, you know, sometimes I'll work, you know, six hours, sometimes I'll work, you know, eight hours, I still take, you know, there may be two nights in a row where, you know, I don't work because I'm just, you know, I've gotten to the point because I'm, you know, I'm actually the opposite of a procrastinator where I like to get things done super fast so I can just like, all right, now I can relax. I know that this is done. And then, you know, I don't have, you know, this project is, is, is good to go for the next two days. I'm going to turn it in and there's probably going to be another two days of a feedback loop. So I've got four days where I'm done with this project and I can focus on other things. So, 
you know, so I mean, it, it's give or take. I mean, sometimes, you know, it can be a pretty long night. Some, you know, sometimes, you know, really all I got to do is just kind of catch up on email. So, I mean, it does vary and fluctuate, but I can tell you that the creative juices are always turning. Right. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> so, yeah. we, really, we really are out of time. So, Derek, I'm going to get Ashley right. to try to schedule you back on. Um, but I know, Sean, right. I wanted to ask a question about your type. So yeah. is there a certain era of type that you tend to pull from for inspiration? And then we'll get the rest of the 10 questions in October. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, in general, like, I, I, I'm not sure the era of this, but but I'm really drawn to sort of like the old billhead type typography sort of stuff so if you think about like the era of like the gold rush like I don't know when was that like 1880s 1890s or was that like around the Civil earlier. War I don't know yeah but is it earlier than that okay. I don't know I'm, I'm terrible not, with time I can so, look yeah. it up yeah oh well my wife would you know she was she if she was here now she'd be yelling I mean she's a teacher so she knows all this stuff and and American history is actually what she teaches so uh, so, but anyway, yeah, so like those, like all the old, uh, bank notes and stuff from like the gold rush era, you know, like all this really elaborate, you know, just, I mean, it's just really classic Americana, uh, style type, you know, where it's, uh, you know, just lots of, uh, lots of spurs and just different, you know, ornate sort of filigree that, that kind of goes around, um, you know, the type. I, I mean that's that's what I'm drawn to, and you even see some of that, some of that type, you know, flowing through like sort of, you know, the the era of the old west, which is kind of about the same uh, same time. But I've even seen you know type inspired by that in uh, shows like Boardwalk Empire, which is more of like a, you know, probably a decade of Art Deco, but they still use some of that that same style of typography, but. But yeah, if I was to say my favorite, my favorite era, that would be it. All right. So I have to mention the Miller Project because that's out on the shelves. You can go and pick up your Miller High Life. Um, and there's a whole series of, it's an artist series, right? So yeah. I took a picture the other day um, and I tagged you in it on Instagram. And he's, you're like, it's everywhere. And it is it's <laughs> super cool. But it, that's such a different... Uh, way for Miller to kind of bring in artists and I don't think anybody's really any big brands have done something like that so and they're it's like a four pack they're taller that you know I don't know if it's the same amount of beer as in the six pack because it doesn't seem like this seems like a skinnier well, yeah, anyway. they're, uh, those are pints. Yes, yeah, 12 ounces. Ver so the taller ones are 16 ounces, which is a pint. So I okay. know my beer. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I want to I want to pull up that picture and then and I'm just going to yeah. quickly go through this. This it's the first one is your sketch. Yep. And the, the really cool thing about this was like this was a project when they approached me that I was super intimidated about. You know, it's like. Harley Davidson Miller, I'm working with uh, Leo Burnett, you know, like one of the biggest advertising agencies. Um, I was like, I, this project is going to be like nothing I've ever experienced. It's going to be so hard. Um, so they came to me with the, the idea um, and, and really what they wanted to do is they wanted to, uh, they wanted each artist to sort of pick a, um, like a value that uh, that that both Miller and Harley, uh, you know, kind of, you know, hold dear. And, you know, one of them uh, was heritage. And then the, I can't remember what the other ones are, but th there were these values. So I, they associated my, you know, my value. And <laughs> now I can't even think of what my value was, but they wanted a cool eagle. So, uh, so I, I drew this out and, this is a refined version of my first pass, but my first pass, they were like, awesome, let's do it. Like, no feedback, no changes. Wow. It blew my mind. So, yeah, it was really amazing. And then this is kind of where it went. Did you end up doing a block print, or was this all in the computer? So this was all in the computer. So the sketch was pencil, obviously. This was all done with the Cintiq. And... My texture, the textures that I bring in to uh, 
to all these pieces are they are block printing textures so like for this one in particular um i i took an empty block without any carving on it and um uh, laid the ink down over the block and then pressed uh pressed the paper to the block and and pulled it off and it just gave me a really cool uh block printing texture that I, I then essentially you know mask that texture out and then it gives me that that sort of block printery sort of uh you know texture to it without actually having to go through and carve it and and uh and and pray that I don't make a mistake <laughs> And then this is what it looks like on um, on the can, if you haven't seen it. And what I thought was really cool, on like as the can yeah. turns, it says Straw Castle. Like it has your name. <laughs> I, I thought that was really I know. cool. Yeah, and that's one of the 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 things that I just I realized with uh, with with these guys, you know, Miller and and Harley, is they really just appreciate craftsmanship, you know. So, and that's one of the reasons why they selected the artists that they did, because they felt like each of us, you know, we just sort of embodied that idea and that spirit of, you know, craftsmanship and, 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 and so much so that they really celebrated the, the artist in this, you know, in this series. I mean, because yeah, my name, you know, the brand, the Straw, Straw Castle brand is actually on the can and it blew my mind when I saw that, um, yeah, just that the, the, they were actually doing that was super cool. And they actually, um, there's a video on YouTube uh, out that, that uh, Miller produced that actually um, highlights the designers as well. So like, so when, uh, when I first got approached by Miller, you know, because of my intimidation of the project, you know, I just wasn't really sure um, that I could handle it. You know, I was super stressed with it. You know, they, you know, they eased my mind by, uh, you know, one day I was working at home and I knocked on, uh, there was a knock on the door and it was a, um, a Miller representative dropping off three cases of, of beer. And I was like, holy crap. And they're, they're really sweetening the pot here. So I was like, oh, that's awesome. And then like uh, about a week later, they sent me like a care package of like a hat and a, you know, a, a worker's shirt and a GoPro camera to actually capture all the, the process of me uh, drawing this. So some of those, uh, some of that process is actually captured and on YouTube in a, a video that they, uh, that Miller produced. And it also, um, you know, the, the other artists are also featured in that. So yeah, it was, it was an amazing project. I think Jason just posted it. So I plopped it up there. So that's awesome. Oh, cool. So you guys check it out later. Thank you, Jason, for um, sending it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. That's what I love about Very this group cool. of people. They're awesome. Um, I yeah. hope you guys enjoy, if you hadn't come before, this is kind of what we do every week, um, except for the next two weeks because I'm going to go hike the Grand Canyon. Um, so I get oh, my yeah, own man. pursuit. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah. I'll be your pursuing. own pursuit of happiness. <laughs> yeah, yeah pursuing some, the high life. Yeah. 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 For sure. And some yeah. sweat. Did you know that they sell? Uh, they have a cantina at the bottom, um, and they sell beer at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I don't know if Miller. So will they? So will they actually like uh, drop you off at the bottom instead of having to climb all the way down to the pit cantina? <laughs> no. Um. You have to. Uh, okay. You can. You can rent mules, but if. Oh, I, there you go. If you're. If you've ever been, it's a really small, um, single, um, it's a really small, narrow uh, path. And yeah. you have to get all over if somebody's coming up. You know, the upper hiker has the right I've of never, way. Which, yeah, I've actually never been, but it sounds amazing. Uh, so are there guardrails or anything? Would you like, no, could you, no. like if you had been drinking and stuff down at the cantina and you're walk back up, I mean, would you potentially fall off the side or what? You could. Are there so, any, Wow, that's a little it, it, scary. I'll take some pictures, but um, I can only imagine being on a mule or a horse or anything. That's a lot taller. I mean, I guess you know I'm five one and three quarters, so I'm pretty close to the ground already. So I don't. We'll round I mean, up to five five. Yeah, I usually tell people I'm six two actually, yeah. but <laughs> they have a hard time believing me. But you know, you don't um, you don't realize if you're. I don't know. I just don't feel real comfortable. I guess I can ride a horse plenty fine, but you know, if I was on that tiny little strip of land, and then it's you look off into a 
chasm, you know, I'm not really excited about that, but I'm fine with that. Well, you know, I wonder, I wonder if the horse probably actually has more experience with that canyon than you do, so yeah. maybe the horse would actually save you from falling off. That's true, but my trip only, yeah. this, well, the actual, you have to get a backcountry pass. Anyway, you people probably don't care to hear about my Grand Canyon adventure, <laughs> but it's like $18 if you just want to hike down, but if you want to rent something to come back up, or if you have to get a helicopter to get you out, it's a lot more than eighteen dollars. So it'll yeah, be. Yeah, um, I can imagine. <laughs> it'll be an adventure. I've done it before. I did it twenty <laughs> years ago. So um, I'm hoping it will. I'll be able to be okay twenty years later. So we'll see. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you'll make it. You'll be. You'll be good. You'll be good. I'm not doing it in August, so that's good. That's what I did when I was 22, because yeah. who I wow, guess I didn't realize <laughs> realize <that laughs> I was uh, she shouldn't do it then. But anyway, yeah. um, but this is what it's like. It's a conversation between designers, and you guys get to be part of that conversation. That's one thing I love about Spreecast is that you're able to do this. Um, thank you guys for coming, Derek. Thank you. <laughs> we really didn't get through much, yeah. so. I'll I'll get Ashley to get you back on hopefully in October. That's what we're booking through now, and um, just I'm really really excited for you about your projects, and I'm excited that you're able to share. And hopefully it helped some people, and hopefully they'll start doing some of their own stuff to get the kind of work they want to do. Yeah, and uh, if they, if they take anything, if anybody takes anything out of this, you know, just spend time, you know, on yourself doing the sort of work that you want to do, and and I know, er, you know, every designer that I've always talked to, you know, says the same thing. And I'm just like, oh, what do you know? I mean, you're just saying that. But it really is true. I mean, it's, you know, uh, just, you know, spend time on yourself, you know, foster your own, uh, you know, your own work and just, you know, pick some personal projects that you want to work on and and develop those. I mean, you'll 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 think yourself. So, yeah, I appreciate you having me today. Uh, it was you know, a lot of fun. Well, I'm going to share a couple of links so people can connect with you if they're not already. Um, you can always yeah. connect with Derek at Straw Castle. You can also check him out on Dribble, and it'll go up there in a second. And then Behance, you just got Castle, which is pretty cool. <laughs> and then, and then you also have your Etsy store. So if you like some of the stuff you've seen today, and you want, you just have to have something. Which I have a T-shirt and a couple prints, and I love this stuff. Um, you can also get it on Etsy. So next time we're going to talk about how he's um, sold his stuff <laughs> online and that whole other part of selling your art, making art for you. And then we'll kind of get into some of these faux brands that you've kind of created. And then also yeah. at, on Instagram, you're at Straw Castle. I think you're the same on Twitter, correct? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then um, is there any other place that you want to tell people? I can't think of anything off the top of my I think that covers it. I mean, that's pretty much my social media outlets. Uh, I am on Facebook as well. Uh, you know, if you just, you know, I guess search for the Straw Castle page. Uh, yeah, the, it's not actually Straw Castle dot, or uh, Facebook.com slash Straw Castle. There's like a sequence of numbers in between that that I don't know what it is. But <laughs> if you just search for it, I'm on there as well. So I think, yeah, I think that covers it. And so then if you want to follow me, I'm on Facebook and Instagram as Design Recharge. And then you can always subscribe to the newsletter and then you won't ever miss. You'll get the questions that I'm going to ask or try to ask. Um, and then you also have an opportunity to send me your questions beforehand. And that is the link up here. Um, it's like designrecharge.com or .org slash subscribe land. And then um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Design Recharge or at Diane Gibbs AU. And then if you want to send me an email, I actually email people back. Um, Diane at designrecharge.org. Thank you guys so much. And Derek, thank you. And I hope we'll see you again soon and maybe at Creative South again too. So yep, we'll, we'll see, do it. See, see y'all later. Thanks <laughs> so much. Thanks.